Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Richard Baker. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor Student Experience. Um, I'm going to make an announcement and thanks for Penny Oakes who's retiring soon. She's probably going to be very cranky with me, um, <laughs> but she, deser she deserves it. She's had a very long and distinguished career here at ANU. It's fitting to acknowledge her tonight, given uh, the fact that the last lecture is part of the work that she's been very instrumental in her time here. Uh, she's been very modest uh, in terms of a contribution, and, uh, but when speaking to Anusra and Pasa last night, they agreed with me that it was really important to acknowledge the wonderful work that she's done since coming here in 1991. Uh, she's uh, worked in psychology, for many years, I uh, was eventually the uh, professor of psychology and the head of department. Uh, she was appointed as the Dean of Students in 2005 uh, and the Pro Vice Chancellor University community that same year before later returning to the position of Dean of Students in 2006. And in seven years as the Dean of Students, she's carried out that role with great distinction, uh, bringing to bear to the position uh, the sort of full benefits of great uh, wisdom and, and personal strengths and professional skills. She's worked impart impartially and confidential confidentially at all times and has been incredibly effective in terms of her role of being a neutral uh, intermediary between students, academics and administrative areas. And finally, I'd just like to say again, it's really fitting to acknowledge her tonight and I'd like to give her a small token of my thanks and the university. Thank you. Thank you. I should just explain the, um, the wine is made by the family of uh, our speaker tonight. Really? And it, <laughs> and it needs to be put down, I told, for 10 to 20 years, Penny, before you can drink it. <laughs> 10 to 20 years. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome to the last lecture for 2013. May I begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people as the traditional owners and custodians of this land on which we meet. So here we are, the final Thursday of the teaching year. Since 2006, except for a brief interruption last year, we have gathered for this warmly anticipated ANU ritual. It's a ritual of celebration, of thanks, of achievement acknowledged and of relieved gratitude as we all realize that we've survived another academic year. Those of you for whom this last lecture has become something of a personal observance will know all about its origins and its intentions, but for the first timers, here's the story. February 2006, a busload of exhausted ANU people is returning from a university retreat in Threadbow. Most of them are trying to catch up on sleep, but down the back there's a huddle. Three student leaders, PASA President Brett Baker, Anusa President Laura Crespo, and immediate past Anusa President Aparna Rao, and the Dean of Students, me. The students want the university to have a new teaching award, something organic, bottom-up, authentic, something designed and driven by students. Brett tells us about an event he'd enjoyed at the University of Utah where he did his first degree, a last lecture to mark the end of the academic year, the lecturer chosen by students in a campus-wide vote. Brett tells us that this was an important ceremonial event that brought the whole university community together. And we'd spent a lot of time at that retreat talking about the ANU community and how best to nurture its spirit. So, an authentic student-driven celebration of great teaching and a community event, event all in one. This idea had to be a winner, we thought, and clearly it was. For that, we can thank the ever-present Dinah Withy, who is down the back there, for her administrative brilliance. We can also thank successive generations of Anusa leadership teams for their energetic custodianship of this event. 
And of course, we can thank all the fantastic ANU academics whose inspiring, unforgettable teaching has provoked students to nominate them for the last lecture, to vote for them in the final ballot, and to turn out on this final Thursday to get one last taste of the winner's brilliance before the year's end. So far, at this event, we've had Chris Roy Smith, Hugh White, Alistair Gregg, Paul Kerwin, John Hutchinson, Ben Wellings. That's our roll call of last lecturers thus far. So it's with great pleasure that I now hand over to a NUSA president, Alex Sladajevic. I've practiced that so many times, and of course I get it wrong. Sladajevic, who will add the seventh name to that luminous list as she introduces the academic chosen by students to deliver the last lecture for 2013. Alex. Good afternoon, ANU students and staff. Welcome to the last lecture and the close of the 2013 academic year. I too would like to take this opportunity to thank Professor Oakes for more than two decades of contribution to the ANU academic and student community. Penny has been a leading academic mentor, life coach and advisor for so many students that have passed through the ANU. And Penny, on behalf of all the ANU students, I'd like to thank you for your time and commitment and patience throughout those years and we wish you the very best in the years that lie ahead. Now, I'm very honoured to be introducing our speaker, Professor Kieran Kirk, who has been elected by the student body as the best lecturer in 2013. Professor Kirk is the director of the ANU Research School of Biology. He carried out his PhD in the Department of Biochemistry at the University of Sydney from 1985 to 1988. From 1989, he worked at the Oxford University Laboratory of Physiology where he held a number of medical research fellowships. Kieran returned to Australia in 1996 as professor and head of the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology in the Faculty of Science at the ANU, holding this post until taking up his present position in June 2009. Kieran's research is on the biology of the malaria parasite and he's a previous recipient of the Roche Medal of the Australian Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology and the Bancroft Macros Medal of the Australian Society for Parasitology. In 2008, Professor Kirk was awarded the ANU Vice-Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Research Supervision, and in 2009, he was awarded both an ANU Vice-Chancellor's Citation for an Outstanding Contribution to Student Learning, as well as an Australian Learning and Teaching Council Citation for Outstanding Contribution to Student Learning. Kieran lectures in first year molecular biology and second, second year cell physiology. He has been nominated for the last lecture ever since its inception in 2006. Kieran is the eldest of six children, has three children of his own, and is renowned for being spotted commuting over campus on his bike. Kieran is also a proud member of the parents band at Turner Primary School. Professor Kirk, the students have had their say. Your lectures are described as being highly interactive, engaging, stimulating, and genuine. You have been elected as the most highly commended lecturer at the ANU, and it is with great honor that I invite you to deliver the last lecture of 2013. Alex, thank you very much indeed for that very generous introduction, and uh, I know I gave you some of that material, but certainly not all of it. Um, <laughs> as, as you've threatened, you, you have done your research. Um, I should like to begin by expressing my appreciation and, and my absolute delight at being first of all nominated for this, um, to give this lecture, and then elected to, uh, to give this year's lecture. I'm certainly very well aware of the quality and the reputations 
as inspiring lecturers of, of previous last lecturers, and Penny read that list, and as well the 39 other nominees who were on the uh, list this year for whom the students voted. Um, and I do feel extremely honoured to be standing here today. Lecturing has been one of the real joys of my career, and I've always felt that it was, it's been a real privilege um, to be on the lecturing staff at a university like this one, to be at the ANU, and to have the opportunity to interact with the, with the really wonderful students that we get here. It has been one of the real highlights of my career. And over the course of the 17 years that I've been here, I've taught first year and second year and third year, and it's been absolutely fantastic. Many, I see many students here today, many familiar faces. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you very much for having been in my classes uh, as well. Um, so my lecture today is going to be about uh, a human disease, and I'm going to talk about malaria. And malaria has, as Alex mentioned, it's been the focus of my research for quite a long time. I've been doing research on malaria for 20 years. And I realize that this is a broad audience from across the university. And, and as such, I, I'm going to include some geography, some history, some economics, some chemistry, and inevitably some molecular biology as well. And in the latter part of the lecture, I'm actually going to tell you a little bit about some of the research that we've done recently in the Research School of Biology, some of the research in particular that was done by a student in my lab. And I'm going to do that for two reasons. For those of you who've been in my lectures, you'll know that I often do talk about my research, the research that we do in, in the School of Biology, uh, that, that my lab and other labs do in the course of lecturing to illustrate particular points. And I want to do that. I'm going to illustrate some particular aspects of molecular biology by talking a little bit about this work. Um, and the other thing I wanted to do was just show you an example of a particular experience that one of the students had. So I'm going to tell you the work that was done by a student called Natalie Spillman, who I first met as an undergraduate in lectures, and she did some research projects along the way, and she did honours, and she did a PhD. And I just wanted to give that as an example of the sort of experience that, that, that some students have at this university, the sort of experiences that we do offer to students. So with that, by way of introduction, let me tell you a little bit about malaria. So malaria is, of course, an infectious disease. It's caused by a single cell parasite, which, as I'll explain, in the course of its life cycle, invades red blood cells, the red blood cells of its host. A hundred years ago, you could have caught malaria in North America. This is a map showing how the distribution of malaria, the disease, has changed really over the last hundred years. So in 1900, it was prevalent throughout Europe. You could have caught malaria in the south of England. You could have caught it in most of the United States. But in the intervening 100 years, due to various effective control me methods, the, the, the um, distribution of malaria has, has restricted, is constrained now around the middle of the world, but it is still very firmly established throughout the tropics, throughout Southeast Asia, throughout Africa, and throughout Central and South America. Malaria is still a major problem in this part of the world. Each year, there are approximately 200 million cases of malaria, and each year, there are approximately 660,000 deaths from this disease. And those are the best figures we currently have. And this is a graph that shows you where people are dying from malaria. This shows how that 660,000 people is distributed. You can see that the death toll is, is, is held predominantly by Africa. And the light blue is children under five years old, and the dark blue is people over five years old. So what you can see very strikingly from this is that the people, by and large, predominantly, the people who are dying from malaria are children under the age of five living in Africa. And if you go into any African hospital at particular times of year, you'll see pediatric wards that are full of children who are sick from malaria, and many of whom, 550,000 of whom, each year uh, are dying from the disease. So in terms of Africa in particular, throughout the developing world, but Africa in particular, it is a major uh, health problem. Now, you will catch malaria if you are bitten by a female Anopheles mosquito that has previously fed on someone who is carrying the parasite, who has the disease. And the parasite will go from the salivary gland of the mosquito into the human host. It'll go into your bloodstream. It'll make its way first to your liver. And then one parasite will invade one liver cell. And it will stay there for about two weeks. And at this point, you don't know that you're unwell. You're not unwell. The parasite is replicating many, many thousands of times. It's producing thousands of new parasites inside a single liver cell. The liver cell is getting bigger and bigger. And two weeks later, the liver cell bursts, and a thousand, thousands of parasites come into the bloodstream. And each one of those thousands has the capacity to invade one of your red blood cells. And that's what it does. A single parasite invades a single red blood cell. It burrows inside. 
It spends 48 hours inside a red blood cell, during which time it replicates. It produces 30 new parasites. After 48 hours, the red cell bursts, the parasites escape, and each of those 30 new parasites can invade a new red blood cell. And so the cycle continues, and you have more and more red blood cells invaded, and you have more and more parasites in your blood. And that's when the symptoms start. And it will start with fevers and chills and sweating, and you'll develop a headache, and you'll start vomiting. And then as the d d d disease progresses and more of your red cells are destroyed by the parasite, you'll have anemia. In some cases, you'll go into respiratory distress. And in some cases, you'll develop a coma. You'll become unconscious. And in those cases, that's when, in many cases, the patient will die. In terms of what we can do about this, we don't currently have a vaccine. Despite many, many years of effort, we have nothing we can give you that will stimulate your immune system to provide you with protection against malaria. If you're going to malaria endemic region, there is nothing we can give you by way of a vaccine that will protect you. So we have always been reliant on other treatments. And the sort of treatments that we've had have varied over the various centuries. So this is a picture of Galen of Pergamon. He lived from 131 to 201 AD. He lived in Rome, but he was a Greek physician. And his ideas were that those presenting with fever, chills, sweat, headaches, vomiting, symptoms we now associate with malaria, these people are suffering, he thought, from an imbalance of the four humours. And these people are best treated by bleeding and purging or both. So the four humours are the four bodily fluids, as they then understood us to have. And it's the yellow bile, the black bile, the phlegm and the blood. And the symptoms that we now know to be malaria, they thought was an imbalance of these four bodily fluids. And he thought the best thing was to take some blood out and to cause the person to vomit. And of course, for someone who's got anemia and is already dehydrated from vomiting, that's possibly the worst thing you could do to them. And, and, and such was his influence that, and such was our level of ignorance, but for the next 1,500 years, the treatments that he had recommended held sway. So for 1,500 years, this is how people with malaria were treated with bleeding and with purging. We don't do that anymore. We now have medicines. We have drugs with which we can combat malaria. And the first drug that we had was a molecule called quinine. And quinine was a South American herbal remedy. The indigenous people of Peru were taking bark from the cinchona tree, and they were boiling it up, and people who were suffering from these fevers and sweats and headaches, they were being given an infusion of bark from the cinchona tree, and it was curing them. And we now know that the active ingredient in the bark from the cinchona tree is a molecule called quinine. And the Jesuit missionaries in the 1700s saw the indigenous people treating themselves with this. At that stage, malaria was still prevalent in Europe, and they brought the bark back to Europe, and they started treating people in Europe with the bark from the cinchona tree. And that was really the first anti-malarial chemotherapy. They didn't realize at the time, but the active molecule was quinine. And quinine, if you drink tonic water, qu tonic water contains quinine. And if you put tonic water under an ultraviolet light, it will fluoresce, and it will fluoresce because of the quinine molecules that are in the tonic water. In the 20th century, in the earlier part of the 20th century, 1930s, German chemists identified a molecule that was quinine-like, but which they could make in the laboratory much more easily. And then it was developed by American chemists and, and, US che and, and British chemists towards the end of the war. And this was a molecule called chloroquine. And chloroquine is the best anti-malarial drug that we have ever had. The chemists could make it relatively easily. And importantly, they could make it relatively cheaply. It was a safe drug, and it was very effective. It killed parasites very effectively. So for some decades, for the decades after the war, chloroquine was our primary anti-malarial medicine. And concern about malaria began to fade away. We had chloroquine. We could treat malaria. But then, this is what happened. This is a map showing what happened, first of all, towards the end of the 1950s, around 1960, in two places in the world, there began to appear cases of malaria where the patients were treated with the chloroquine, and the chloroquine no longer worked. And it became clear that in two different places, at about the same time, the malaria parasite had somehow become resistant to the chloroquine. And the resistant parasites, they began to spread. And the dark shows where they started. And you can see as the colors, go, as the colors 
go get more lighter. You can see the spread. You can see through the 1960s and the 1970s, resistant parasites spread throughout Southeast Asia and spread throughout India. They spread throughout South America, and then disastrously, throughout the 1980s, these parasites that were resistant to chloroquine started moving across Africa, and that left us with the situation we have today, that the anti-malarial wonder drug that we had, chloroquine, no longer works in Africa because the parasites have become resistant to this particular drug. And we don't have many drugs left. Or to be absolutely accurate, we have one very good drug. And that one very good drug is, again, a herbal medicine. This time, it's a Chinese herbal medicine. And it's a molecule called artemisinin. And artemisinin comes from a plant called Artemisia annua, or sweet wormwood. And the Chinese developed artemisinin. It was an ancient Chinese herbal remedy for fevers. And in the 1970s, a big team of scientists in communist China developed, applied the chemistry. They isolated the particular molecule from the sweet wormwood that the parasite was sensitive to, that could kill the parasite very effectively, and the molecule they called artemisinin. And we knew almost nothing about this. This happened in communist China. It was published in Chinese, in internal communist Chinese journals. Um, but nevertheless, it is the best anti-malarial that we have. And from 2006, it has been the recommended frontline drug for malaria in Africa. It's the best thing we have. La or two years ago, some American scientists went back and asked the question, well, where did this come from? Who were the chemists who did this work? And then to identify this particular woman, Tu Yu Yu, from the Chinese Academy of Science, who led a big team of Chinese chemists who isolated this molecule and developed it. And in 2011, she got the Alaska Award for clinical medical research, and many people who get the Alaska Award go on to win the Nobel Prize. So that it's an interesting question whether the communist Chinese team, led by Tu Yuyu, will win the Nobel Prize for the discovery of artemisinin, a drug therapy for malaria that has saved millions of lives across the globe, especially in the developing world. It is now our frontline drug. It is now the single drug that works very effectively throughout the world, and, and we rely on it, particularly in Africa. And then, in 2011, at the very end, it became clear that there were a number of cases that were no longer responding to artemisinin. Artemisinin was not working in Southeast Asia in just a few places as effectively as it was a few years ago. So that's from two years ago, and the WHO immediately put out a document they called the Global Plan for Artemisinin Resistance, because this is a worst-case scenario. If the parasites become resistant to this drug, as they did to chloroquine, then we don't have anything left. This is data from 12 months ago, November 2012. This is Southeast Asia. Each of these are reports of cases of malaria which have been treated with artemisinin, and the artemisinin, it still works, but it works much more slowly than it, it, works more slowly than it did previously. It's very clear now that parasites are becoming resistant to the last anti-malarial drug that we have. As of last month, from data from Africa, it seems that there is no artemisinin resistance yet in Africa. But it's very clear that it's present in Southeast Asia, and if artemisinin resistance gets to Africa and we can no longer treat Africans who have malaria, then that is going to be a public health disaster. And so it's very concerning. And so the question is, well, what about new drugs? Why don't we have more drugs if this is killing so many people? And the answer comes back down very much to money. And I just want to give you a few numbers around the, the finances around developing of drugs. Pharmaceutical companies develop drugs. That's what they do. They develop lots of drugs. And over the period 1975 to 1999, 1,399 drugs in total for all sorts of diseases were released by the pharmaceutical companies. Of those, 13 of them were for tropical diseases. None of them were for malaria. Pharmaceutical companies have very little interest in tropical diseases, and certainly no interest in malaria. And the reason for that is very simple. These are two different pie graphs. This shows the distribution of the world population. And on the left, this shows what people spend on drugs. This is the world drug market. So in terms of world population, this is from 2001, when the world population was 6 billion. You can see that three quarters of the world lived in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Another 9% lived in Latin America. 80% of the world's population lives in Asia, Africa, or South America. 20% lives in the rest of the world, including us. 
When you look at what people spend on drugs, 42% of the total amount of money in the world that is spent on drugs is spent in America, in the United States. 27% is spent in Europe, 11% is spent in Japan. So you have 80% living in Africa, Asia and South America, and yet they're only spending 20% of the total spend on drugs. The big spend on drugs, 80% of the total amount of money, 406 billion in 2002, was being spent by Americans and Europeans and Japanese. And those are the people that the pharmaceutical companies are interested in because that's where there is money to be made. And just to put that in a little bit of context, drug companies, pharmaceutical companies, spend an absolute fortune. They spend a huge amount of money developing drugs for all sorts of things. In 2000, Pharmaceutical companies spent $44 billion on research and development into new drugs, new treatments for all sorts of things. In 2004, the total spend, and none of this was from drug companies, the total spend on malaria research was only $300 million. It's much less than 1% of the total amount that the drug companies are spending. And just to give this a bit of context, these are the sorts of things that pharmaceutical companies spend a lot of money on. And you can see why. For drugs, to treat impotence in middle-aged men for drugs like Viagra, the sales in 2004 were two and a half billion dollars. The advertising budget for Viagra and associated drugs in 2004 was 400 million. That's more than we spent in total in the same year on malaria research worldwide. Americans spend three and a half billion dollars each year treating hair loss. We spend much more money on researching the causes and treatments of male baldness than we do on spending it on research into tropical disease. Allergen made $560 million selling Botox in 2003 to make Americans, Europeans, Australians less wrinkly. Uh, it's a large money spinner. Pharmaceutical companies are much, much more interested in wrinkly, bald, impotent <laughs> Americans, Europeans and Australians than they are in Africans, in Asians, in the developing world, people who have tropical diseases. And that's just reflected in the numbers. You can see the numbers there. But things have changed. Things have changed over the last 10 years, and they are still changing very fast in very large part due to the intervention of Bill and Melinda Gates through the Gates Foundation. And Bill and Melinda Gates, as I'll show you, have invested a huge amount into research into tropical diseases, and in particular, into malaria. And Bill Gates, in particular, is passionate about this and very knowledgeable about it. This, comes, this photo comes from a presentation he gave a few years ago. He invited many of his rich friends. He had 250 of his very rich friends together in a room, um, very, all the A-list from the United States, and he came into a room like this, and he had a big jar full of mosquitoes. And then he undid the lid, and they were all looking at each other and wondering what was going to happen next. And this is what he said. He said, malaria is spread by mosquitoes. I brought some. Here, I'll let them roam around. There's no reason only poor people should be infected. And, and, and eventually explained, no, they, they are real mosquitoes, but they didn't have malaria parasites. But it was just to make the point. Um, they have invested a huge amount, and that's shown here. This is the total amount that is spent on research into malaria in 2003, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And in 2003, you can see the dark orange is the money spent by the National Institutes of Health. That's the American agency that funds biomedical research. The light orange at the top is things like the Wellcome Trust, charities, um, various private organisations. And the medium orange is the, is the Gates Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And you can see in 2004, 5, 6 and 7, the total spend on malaria research is increasing. And that's particularly because the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation increased their contribution. And that has continued to increase in the six years since then. And it is now the case that Bill and Melinda Gates are the major funders of malaria research worldwide. The amount of money that they've put into this has been enormous. Uh, they have made an enormous difference, and that's why I don't feel too resentful when my Microsoft products um, let me down yet again, um, <laughs> b because this has been an extraordinary contribution, and it has made a huge difference. And as a result, we do have some drugs coming through. We do have drugs in development that we now are beginning to see could be there if artemisinin should fail, as it looks like it is beginning to in Southeast Asia. And you don't look at the detail on this. This is a snapshot. It's put together by a Gates Foundation funded organization. Each of these colored boxes is a new treatment for malaria at different stages of development. So these are the treatments. Each of these yellow boxes are treatments at the early research stage. 
These are the ones that are just being tested in healthy patients and in small groups of malaria-infected patients. These are the ones that are being tested uh, in larger groups and some, some cases have actually been released. We now have a whole lot of molecules, a whole lot of compounds, a whole lot of treatments that we now think may be there if and when artemisinin fails because we desperately need that to be the case. And for the rest of the lecture, I'm going to talk specifically about drugs or about one particular drug, and then we're going to come into the molecular biology. If you look on the right-hand side, these are all the drugs that are in the fairly late stage. And none of these treatments, none of these coloured boxes, are actually new chemical structures. What these are, they've taken old drugs and the chemists have done clever things to modify it, or they've put together different combinations of old drugs in very effective ways, but there's no genuinely new chemistry here. These compounds are either modifications of old drugs or combinations of old drugs. These are the drugs that are just being trialled in the first groups of malaria patients now. Most of these are old drugs, but there's one exception. And for the chemists in the audience, this is a brand new structure. This is a novel compound, and it is the first genuinely novel molecule, the first genuinely novel molecular structure to be used as an anti-malarial, to be tested in people who have malaria for over 20 years. So it's a compound around which there is a lot of excitement at the moment. It could be a brand new and very effective drug. And for the rest of the lecture, I'm going to talk about this specific molecule, and I'm going to talk about work that we've done here at the ANU on how this particular molecule, this new drug, this first novel structure, trialled in patients for 20 years, how we think it works. This drug was first reported relatively recently. The first report in the scientific literature was just over three years ago. It was a big paper in Science. They called this particular compound a spiroindolone. That's the name they gave. They did a very big study, and this is how they started. They had a library of 12,000 molecules. They had bought this from a company in Russia. It was just a collection of 12,000 completely different molecules. Some of them were natural products, isolated from plants from all around the world. Some were things made by chemists. They were 12,000 random molecules. And what they did was that they used robots to test the effect of each of those 12,000 molecules on malaria parasites. They have these high throughput robotic systems. Here's a picture of them here, working very fast. These robots can ask the simple question, in a test tube, if you have some malaria parasites, does this compound kill the parasites? And they screened 12,000 compounds and they found particular compounds that did kill malaria parasites very effectively. And these with a spiroindolone. So they had identified, using robots to screen a huge library of molecules, they identified some molecules that were very effective at killing parasites. They didn't know how they killed parasites, but they did know that they were very good at doing so. And what I want to do now is tell you a little bit about, about the work that we've done to try and understand how these molecules, which, which as I said, are in clinical trials, how they kill malaria parasites. And I want to tell you in particular about the work that was done by Natalie Spillman. And Natalie was a PhD student. She came to the ANU from northern Queensland. She came to specialise in physics and maths. She was initially a rather reluctant biologist, uh, but then she did some biology and she quite liked it. So she's now a very enthusiastic biologist. She did research projects as an undergraduate. She did honours, she did a PhD, uh, and now she's a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Washington. And, and as of last week, she's now got an NHMRC fellowship to um, continue on her, her research career for another four years. So this uh, is a story of uh, an ANU student, much like uh, many of you are, a particular research project that she did here. And her PhD project focused on salt. And the basic question was, how does the malaria parasite control its internal salt concentration? Now, control of salt concentration is something I've been interested in for a long time. It's something that all cells have to do. All cells have to maintain, for various reasons that I won't go into, they have to maintain a low internal sodium concentration. Salt, that's common table, so it's salt, sodium and chloride in a water solution, in a biological system, sodium chloride dissociates to become sodium ions and chloride ions, and all cells have to take a lot of trouble to ensure that their internal sodium concentration stays low. So all cells, whether they're bacteria or yeast or plants or animals or humans, they all have mechanisms for pushing out sodium ions. It's important that they keep the sodium concentration low. So Natalie's question was, well, does the parasite keep its sodium low? And if it does, how does it do that? She was looking at the molecular mechanism of salt extrusion or sodium regulation in the parasite. 
And the basic experiment that she did was this. So this is a schematic representation. This is a red blood cell. We get blood from the blood bank. We infect it with malaria parasites. And then we need to be able to ask, well, what is the sodium concentration? What is the salt concentration inside the parasite just here? And the way that we do that is that we treat the red blood cells with a molecule that punches big holes in the red cell surface. And all of the red cell contents come out. So this is the red cell membrane. It's now got big holes in it, so there's nothing left. But the parasite stays intact. And then we take these isolated intact parasites and we load them with a fluorescent molecule. And it's a molecule called SBFI. And this is a picture here. This is the permeable, permeabilized red cell membrane that we've punched holes in. This is the parasite that's intact within, within that. This is the fluorescing parasite. We're looking down a fluorescent microscope. We've loaded it up with this particular molecule that has the property of fluorescing. And the fluorescence changes in response to changes in the level of sodium. So it's a fluorescent indicator. The, the level of fluorescence tells us what the level of sodium is inside the parasite. And we can calibrate that, and we can quantitatively then estimate what is the sodium concentration, the level inside the parasite. And we know that the sodium level is about tenfold less than the sodium level outside, that a malaria parasite does keep a low sodium concentration. It's much lower than the sodium concentration outside. In other words, for every 10 sodium ions outside, there is only one sodium ion inside. And, and all cells do that. All cells have to keep sodium pushed out. And this just shows what we thought would be the case already. Malaria parasites do this too. They keep the sodium level inside less than the sodium level outside. So they must have some sort of pumping mechanism to push the sodium ions out. Now we knew, and we know, that there are various pathways by which sodium can leak back in again. And we know that this happens in all cells. Sodium leaks in, and then there are effective molecular pumps that push the sodium out. It's a bit like, and I think of it like this, like a leaky boat. So you have a boat uh, which has got holes in it, and you've got water trying to come in from the outside, and if you've got an effective pump and you can pump the water out, providing you can pump fast enough, you can keep the water level lower inside than it is outside, and your boat will stay afloat. And that's what's happening in terms of sodium ions with the parasite. It's got some sort of pumping out mechanism. We know it's leaking back in, but providing the pump can pump fast enough, then the sodium will stay low and the parasite will be fine, at least from the point of view of sodium. And so we represent it like this. Here's a, this is the molecular sodium pump sitting there, and this is the sodium being pushed out, and then it's leaking back in again. So let me just say a little bit more about molecular sodium pumps. So those who have been in my lectures know that I always use old coat hangers. Um, and this is as now, this, uh, you've seen this before, but this is a molecular sodium pump. So sodium pumps are proteins. And, and much of what happens that is interesting at a molecular level in biology is done by proteins. Proteins are fantastic. They can do all sorts of things, including be molecular sodium pumps. So this particular protein, I'll say a bit more about proteins in a minute, but this is a protein that sits here at the surface of the malaria parasite, and this is a protein that is able to recognize sodium ions, and it recognizes sodium ions, and it pulls them in, and then it flicks them out like that. And that's what it does, and it does that thousands of times a second with the sodium ions coming in, recognizing the sodium ions and flicking them out, and then they'll come leaking back in again, and providing that the pump is fast enough, then it'll keep the sodium levels low and the parasite will be fine. So Natalie did a lot of these experiments. She looked at the sodium pumps, she looked at the sort of characteristics, she looked at things that slowed it down or sped it up, and the more she learned about the sodium pumping characteristics of the parasite, the clearer it became that what we were seeing in a parasite was actually very similar to what the botanists had seen when they were studying sodium pumping in things like algae and things like moss and things like fungi. It became clear that the way that a malaria parasite was pushing out sodium seemed to be, in terms of its general characteristics, seemed to be the same way that plants did it, and quite differently from how you and I push sodium out from our cells. So then we ask the question, OK, well, the, the, the malaria parasite seems to have something that looks like a plant in terms of pushing out sodium. Does it have a protein that looks like that plant protein? Because the botanists had done the molecular biology. They knew what the plant sodium pump looked like. And so let me explain what I mean by look like. In terms of what a protein looks like, you have to understand that a protein is made of amino acids. 
you and I and plants and trees and animals and bacteria and everything else have 20 amino acids that we use to make our proteins. And proteins are long, long chains, sometimes thousands of amino acids stuck together. They're not, the chains are not branched, they're linear chains, and they're folded up in interesting and complex ways that lets them do all sorts of interesting things. But proteins are made of amino acids, and when I say what a protein looks like, what I'm talking about is the particular sequence, the order of amino acids. Which of the 20 is there? which of the 20 is there, which of the 20 is there, etc. And so this is what a protein looks like. Each of these is a different amino acid. This is a protein, that's asparagine, that's one of them. Glycine's another, phenylalanine, glutamine, uh, alanine, arginine. Each of those are the 20 amino acids. And in all proteins, they're made of these 20 and they're in a different order, and that determines the shape they adopt, and that determines the sorts of biological things they can do. And so when I say, and so as I said, the plant scientists knew the structure of the sodium pump from plants, and we were then able to ask the question, well, you see that particular sequence of amino acids, and it's about 1,500 to make a plant sodium pump. Does the malaria parasite have anything like that? And we were able to do that because we, had, well, we already knew the sequence of the genome of the malaria parasite, which means we knew the DNA sequence, which means that we knew the sequence of all 5,000 proteins that a malaria parasite has. And certainly one of those 5,000 proteins looked a lot like, in terms of the order of amino acids, it looked a lot like the sodium pump that we had seen, that the botanists had seen in plants. So we then thought we knew which of the parasites, 5,000 proteins, was the sodium pump. And this is a figure, so this just shows, this is, this is how the amino acid chain. This is our best guess. This was a model that was done yesterday by Esther and Adelaide in my lab. Thank you for that. This is our representation of the structure of the malaria parasite protein that looks like the sodium pump from plants. And you can see it's beautiful and it's complex and it's folded up in a very particular way and it's folded up in a particular way so that it can recognize sodium and push it out from one side to the other. So I now need to take you back to this paper and bring this all together. Because this paper started off with robots and they screened 12,000 compounds and they found some compounds that were very effective at killing parasites and then they did a very elegant experiment. They took those compounds and they exposed parasites to those compounds, that particular compound, a spiroindolone. They put low concentrations in with the parasite, not enough to kill the parasite but enough to make it very sick and then they left it there for four months and the parasite struggled and didn't like it much but then over a period of four months, the parasites began to grow. They had become resistant to the spiroindolone. It's not very resistant. If you increase the spiroindolone dose a bit more, the parasites died, but they had become partially resistant over a period of four months. And they took those resistant parasites and they sequenced the genome and they asked the question, what had changed? And they did it multiple times and one particular protein had changed. In the resistant parasites, the particular parasite that had changed, the particular protein that had changed was the same molecule that we had already become interested in. It was the molecule called PFATP4. It was our candidate sodium pump. So when I say changed, what I mean is that there were mutations in the protein. Now let me just explain what I mean by a mutation. So here again is my long protein made from amino acids and it's folded up in this particular way and it's, you've got amino acids in a particular order when I say change, I mean there has been a mutation and I mean there has been a change in the amino acid, in that one just there. And because there's been a change in that amino acid, the protein has changed shape because the shape of the protein depends on the order of the amino acids. And so when they took these parasites and for three months grew them in the presence of the drug, some parasites had, had undergone mutations, they had changed the shape of their protein and by changing the shape of that protein they had become resistant to the drug that is now um, looking like an effective anti-malarial. And so this was the situation when this paper came out. Natalie had been doing it for a PhD. We thought we knew what the malaria sodium pump was. We thought it was this plant-like protein. It was called PFATP4. Um, we thought it was there to pump out sodium, and we still think that. That's what it does. It sits on the membrane, it pumps out sodium. The Novartis people had a new drug. And they didn't know how it worked, but they did know that the the drug stopped working or was, became a lot less effective when this same protein, the sodium pump, changed its shape. And so we put that together to a particular hypothesis. What if, so this is the drug, what if the spiroindolone, the new drug, 
actually interacts and sticks to this sodium pump protein. And when it's sticking to the sodium pump protein, then it can't pump sodium anymore. And if it can't pump sodium anymore, then the parasite will fill up with sodium, and that'll be a lethal event. And then a mutation in this protein changes the shape, and then if the shape changes, the drug doesn't stick anymore because the shape has changed, and then it can start pumping sodium again. And so that all made sense, that this is the sodium pump, that their drug hits the sodium pump, that the parasite can change the shape of the sodium pump in such a way that the drug doesn't stick anymore and the parasites become resistant. And if that's true, well, let's do the experiment. And this is the one bit of data I want to show you, the actual experiment. This is our hypothesis that these drugs kill parasites by blocking the sodium pump. This is the experiment. We took therapeutic levels of the drug. So here's our parasites. We used the dye. We added the drug at the same levels that you'd give a patient, and straight away the sodium concentration went up. The parasites filled up with sodium, just as you would expect if the drug is coming in and blocking the sodium pump of the parasite. So it all made sense. And Natalie's sodium pump was interacting with this new drug from Novartis, and the drug was stopping the sodium pump was working, and the parasite was filling up with sodium. And so that was the, that's really the end of that story. We, but, well, it's the beginning of the story, really. We're still working on it, but we published the paper, and that came out in February of this year, and that, that, was, um, that was nice. And we actually got, we put out a little press release, and then we got quite a lot of coverage. Some things the press picks up, and sometimes they don't. Um, and, and this was good. This was our press release. This got picked up by the ABC. This was on the ABC new website. Scientists discover malaria's, malaria's Achilles heel. That was our sodium pump, the Achilles heel. That was one of the words we used. And I told them about boats and pumping and leaking, and I, I, tried to, I tried to simplify it. And, 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 you know, we hear a lot about communicating with the public, and I do my best on that, and I simplified it, and I, I didn't want to talk about sodium ions and protein structure, and I, um, so I talked about salt. I talked about a little salt pump, and, and it's like a leaky boat, and there's a salt pump, and if you stop the salt pump working, the parasite fills up with salt. And then I began to see some strange stories on, on the web, and this was our favourite. Um, <laughs> this, is, um, this is from Top News. And, then, uh, and it said, salt overdose, enough to kill malaria. A study carried out by researchers at Australian National University has discovered that the deadly malaria parasite can be defeated with the use of salt alone. Um, and then I started getting asked questions in interviews. So say, and, they, and the interviews would say, so I'm going to uh, Africa next week, and um, on the basis of your research, I'll just take some table salt. Is that OK? Uh, and, and I really had to, and it was a lesson for me in terms of trying to simplify stuff. And, and I, I did try and damp that down. I just hope nobody died as a result. Um, and that is the end of that story. And that is the end of my lecture. And thank you all once again very much for coming. Good afternoon. I'm Arjuna, the president of PASA. Professor, we had a fantastic talk about malaria. And thanks for sharing a bit of the history, the economics, the science behind it. Coming from a developing country in the tropics, I can closely relate to malaria because I've seen some of my close friends die from malaria when I was schooling. And it's fantastic to see that this amount of enthusiasm and the dedication in doing over two decades of research, where in the not too distant future that we will see a silver lining in this cloud. Um, to all those who are here, we would like to thank you for taking this evening and coming and listening to the last lecture. I do see some of you are twitching in your seats. And just to let you know, there are refreshments in the common room that's just outside to your right hand side. And before we bring the proceedings to a close, I would like to read the ode to end the last lecture. It seems a welcome irony that we look so gratefully to the end of this academic year, but still take the effort to listen to one last lecture. We have no obligation, no monetary or assessment-like intent. Yet, still we fill this hole, not, learn, not afraid to learn and give. We demonstrate respect for this institution of learning and the values that it brings.
collegiality, commitment, pride, responsibility, freedom, and service. So my friends, prepare to put those books back on their dusty shelves. Dismantle the study places. Those nook and cranny like retreats. And stand with me and thank Professor Kirk as he exits this hall and thus ends this academic year. Thank you. Thank you.